been, I've been living in Taiwan for about eight years. I've been living in Taiwan for about eight years, and um, I've been teaching ESL and EFL in the university for about 10 years, so in both the U.S. and Taiwan. Um, right now, I'm a PhD student in the Graduate Institute of Learning and Instruction here at NCU. I also teach some courses here at NCU for the staff at the management college. And that's because there are a lot of students, um, exchange students over there, or they're also just regular students that have NCU scholarship or Cal scholarship, but they don't have they don't have the Chinese ability, but they still need to communicate with the staff. So the the dean over the management college has to go there to teach the staff to try to help uh, help boost up their English so they're able to communicate um, with the students. Uh, I'm also teaching part time at uh, in Taipei. And um, let's see. Uh, yeah, hopefully I will graduate next next semester. I've been here for six, almost six years. It's a long time. It's a long time to spend to study for a PhD. But you know, in Taiwan, it takes a long time to get a PhD. Unlike in, that's the first difference between the years and, and the Taiwan. It's, it's much quicker in the US, but it's much more expensive in the US. So I'm kind of slower, but um, um, it's cheaper. So I'm, I'm very lucky to have to have, uh, receive the Taiwan Scholarship for the first three years, and then for the last three years of the PhD Scholarship. Um, so uh, as I said, I've had a lot of experience teaching at a lot of different universities in Taiwan, and I also have taught uh, some Courses. It's a very, they're very special courses. There are a lot of students in Taiwan um, want to get into medical, medical uh, college and medical departments, but they can't, they can't get in. But they still want to be doctors. They still want to be dentists. Um, so, as a kind of alternative, they, they go to Europe um, to, for medical school, and then they come back to Taiwan to uh, take their tests and become doctors. So, I've taught a lot of these students in some special programs and, um, to boost up their English to go to Spain to study to get a, a medical degree or a So I've, all, I've taught some very special programs. So I, I, I think my situation is quite unique because I'm, I'm, sometimes I'm on this side of the, of the stage and sometimes I'm up in the front of the stage. So I think I have a um, view like on things because I, under I understand how it is to be a student in Taiwan and in the U.S. and I also know how it is to be a teacher um, so, uh, in, in the U.S. and in Taiwan. So um, I have a lot to share, but I had to cut it down. So uh, I'm I'm only going to share a few parts, but we have to shoot it later so we can ask more detailed questions. So. The title of my talk, though, is um, Like a Fish Out of Water, or Tales on a Cat Mole Becoming a Frog, Developing Intercultural Confidence. And I'll explain what the, this title means. Um, so, I mean, when, you, when people ask you which, which animal better understands water, uh, most people would think about, would think about a fish. You know, oh, that's the fish. You know, a fish lives in water, they touch it every day, they need it to survive. So you'll think that, oh, fish will be the one that understands water. But this fish is out of water, and it's painting, it's not in water, so it's almost ready to die. Um, but if you think about a frog, a frog is, is born in the water. They live in the water for a long time, and then they grow up, and then they grow and uh, I think I think um, the life of a frog is more complex, maybe more confusing and difficult, but I think it's more rewarding. And of course, this is an analogy for life. Like, if we only live in our own culture, we only speak our, our own mother tongue, and we never venture out, 
uh, many things are much simpler for us, but our perspective is very limited. But if we if we are more like frogs, we start out, you know, in water and we learn about the water and then we go into a, a new realm, a new place, and then we we can have a better perspective in order we have something to compare it with. So we can better understand water because we have we have air to compare it to. And also like a frog, sometimes a frog is in is out in the air and it feels uh, it starts to get dry, so we go back to the water to be refreshed. Just like sometimes we go back to our mother culture, our mother language to get refreshed and feel better. But it has, but you know, sometimes so when you go back into the water your skin will get wrinkly and you'll start to miss the air again. So I think that all of us should be like frogs and we should um, we should experience different cultures, be open-minded, and uh, learn from both parts of our, our lives where they may be. So um, I want to pre preface what I'm going, about to say by saying that uh, I've been in Taiwan for eight years. If I didn't love Taiwan, I wouldn't be here. And so the things I'm going to share with you, I'm going to share um, some positive things that I felt about the U.S. and some negative things I felt about the U.S. Also, some positive things I think about Taiwan, some negative things about Taiwan. You can ask me more details about me if, if you wish. But um, I already feel that I'm just like a frog. I'm, I'm already have Taiwanese and have American. I can, it's really hard for me to, to maybe fit in either place for too long. Um, so, first, I want to talk a little bit about. Um, Education, and I'll talk about. I want to talk about students first. So, uh, from my experience, for uh, students in the U.S. and students, I difference between students in the U.S. and students in Taiwan, I find that um, I remember when I was a student in the U.S. and I, I, when we went to class, we'd be there five minutes early. Would be on time, but in Taiwan. Um, well, 10 minutes late often is on time. And I'm not saying that's a negative thing, but because now I'm, I'm changed, it's really hard for me to make it now on time to class at, at 10 minutes. Uh, you know, I'm usually a little bit late. And I think it's, I don't know, I don't know which is a better system. I think maybe both are negative. Come there early for what? To stand outside the door and wait for the teacher to open it? Or if you come late, some people are waiting. Or maybe a teacher, but uh, it just depends. And also the motivation. Um, even I think the my the school I went to for my undergraduate wasn't that great of a school in the U.S. But I felt all of the students were motivated to get a high high school. Uh, but in Taiwan, the, maybe because the system is different, um, you don't have like a set like okay the, these courses. Uh, are your courses from your major and you have to get a certain grade in them. So there's less motivation. A lot of students just want to pass. Okay, 60 is enough. Um, but I, I think sometimes that's uh, not a good not a good mindset to have. Why, why do you want to limit yourself to only achieving 60% of the knowledge? But then again, I also think it's like some things people have already talked about today. Maybe it's because a lot of it is just memorization. So when I first became a teacher, I thought that people, when I heard students say that, like, oh, it's fine, I only need 60. I was like, what does that mean, I only need 60? I was quite, hey, unless there was, some, there was some graduate students that said, oh, I'm taking a course, but I need 70. I was like, um, OK, um, good luck. I, don't, I, I didn't know what to say when the student said to me, I need 70. I was like, well, I need a lot of things too, so you work with me, and, and I'm sure that my class is easy enough for you to, to get a 70. Um, there's a lot of things that's different about classroom behavior. And of course, like I said, these are only my stories. Um, I was quite surprised too when students, when I was teaching, and a lot of students, oh, they, they just brought their breakfast or lunch into the class and they will eat their lunch or breakfast in Taiwan. I thought, um, 
always quite strange. It's a little bit strange behavior. But then I was, um, I was told, oh, well, don't be so hard. The student, it's 8 o'clock in the morning, and the students had to get up early and go to your class. Let them eat their breakfast. And I was just like, oh, but I got up early enough to eat my breakfast. Yeah, so it was a kind of different thing. I'm not saying it's like every student in every class, but I was quite shocked about that. Now, if you ask me now, I'm just like, oh, if you come to my class and you show up, I'm happy. Whether you have your food or not, just come. Yeah, I'll be happy if you just come. So, you know, people change. People change. Uh, also, teachers. Um, oh, I had a real hard problem when I first came here because I was very, when I first came to teach, I was so, I tired myself out. I was, I was like, oh, I have to care about every 50 student in the class. And for all, all seven classes that I'm teaching, but I, I was, I was too tired, you know, I was so worn out. I was just like, and then I got the point, I found out, oh, there are so many of them and there's only me. So what you have to do is give more responsibility to you. To the students, let them decide who is going to uh, who, who wants to work harder in the class and want, wants to do more. You make yourself available to everybody, but the ones that really want to learn will come come and find you. And from a student point of view, I was quite shocked when uh, I became a PhD student and I went I went into classes and I sat down and there was so much group work. There was so much group work and so many presentations. And a lot of the teachers would tell me, oh, I'm using American style to teach you. And I was sitting there and I was like, I don't know, maybe in some, maybe in New York, the university, maybe you studied in. But for me, my experience in the US, it was when I got my master's degree, there was very little group presentations. It was very little group activities uh, done. Uh, if you look at those big universities, you, you, you see them teach these huge auditorium full of students. It's lecture. There's very little, very little group um, work and group presentations going on. But I'm not blaming the teachers because I also understand, you know, that here there's a lot of emphasis on research, and uh, sometimes that that causes some of the teachers to be unable to teach for the entire semester or teach the way they like. But I want to point out, though, um, it's uh, if you look in the, I think some of the best teachers that I've ever had has been in the language center here at NCU. They're one of the most hardest working teachers that I've ever seen. They really teach. They really know how to teach. And they really have a passion for teaching. And I think that that's, that's rare in Taiwan. And um, um, I think that a lot of it has to do with, oh, but it's, it's changed too. Uh, I remember when I, was, when I was first hired and I was teaching in a national university and um, my contracting was for teaching. It's for teaching and service. And then after the first year I was home, you're going to be evaluated on teaching, research, and service. And I was just like, research, but my contract is only for teaching and service. They said, I know, but it's the policy that all teachers will be evaluated by teaching, research, and service. And I said, but I wasn't hired to do research. And they said, well, but that's the policy. So I said, so what? I didn't do any research this year. So what's going to happen? They said, oh, well, you will be evaluated as a, um, well, you won't pass your evaluation, but don't worry, you won't be fired. <laughs> so I was just like, hmm, so I'm going to be evaluated as a, you know, in this way, but it's not what I was hired to do. And I know that there's a lot of, you know, a lot of stress on teachers to do more research, but when I think about this issue in contrast to the U.S., I think about, okay, in, in the U.S., you go to some schools, they're not research-oriented schools. But in Taiwan, whether the school is a so-called low-quality school or so-called high-quality school, it seems 
is equal about the amount of research you need to, uh, to do and to publish, which I, see, I think it seems quite unfair. Um, example is like my, the students that I'm teaching in Delhi, they're suppo it's supposed to be a, it's supposed to be a kajidashu, so they're supposed to learn skills. But a lot of the students uh, come to me and, and they say, we're not learning any skills. Because actually it's just becomes like a university. So the students just say, oh, you know, my ability wasn't good enough. My skills were not good enough. My scores were not good enough to get into, you know, a good university. I know that, but I figured I would get skills that I could get a job. But now they feel let down. Okay, they, and I think I found that those students, they're actually very hardworking. All of them have jobs, mostly because of tuition reasons, I think, because they're, maybe they're, you know, everyone knows how bad the economy is in Taiwan, and the, I'm sure that their parents are putting forth a lot of money in order to just pay their tuition. So I always feel, oh, this is a very strange situation, because in the U.S. there will be a lot of community college, uh, colleges, a lot of state universities, and they will, they will all have this kind of uh, situation that they will, they will be able to avoid. Um, but I want to say something. I want to say something about also about my the education that I've received about our research training. I've went to a lot of um, international conferences and, and met a lot of international students there, getting their uh, degrees and over in the U.S. or in England. And when I talk to them and I ask them about their publications, what have you what have you published? They don't have anything. They don't have any publications, and I'm I'm quite I'm quite shocked because I have several, and I so in this kind of situation I feel oh I really think I got the best of both worlds I got my master's in the U S and it's it's about um, English teaching I really got I had a practicum I had an internship I really learned how to be a good teacher and then I came to Taiwan and I got my PhD here and I think it was more you know, research oriented, and I really gained a lot of, you know, research knowledge. I really become became a good researcher. Um, I have uh, SSCI publications. I feel oh, great about myself. But when I look, when I talk to those other students, they went to the U.S. and they spent a lot of money on their education, and they just said, oh, I'm going to graduate next year, but I won't get a job. I don't have any publications here. And these are from very good schools in the U.S. And I just, I think, in this, in this situation, I think in the U.S. is is lacking. And, uh, I think in Taiwan, I really gained a lot. So, um, I also prepared a little bit about work, my ideas about work, and from my experience, and also from my friends, what my friends have told me here in Taiwan. I think there's a difference in the U.S. A lot of bosses want to thank you and want to thank their employees. Um, thank you for doing your job so well. Uh, so I don't have any trouble that I need to take care of. But I think in Taiwan I found out a lot of it is thank me. You should be very thankful that I gave you a job. And you should do everything that I tell you to do. Um, I had a I had a very bad experience one time with uh, one of my one of my bosses because there was a there was a situation where I worked for in Taiwan I worked for um, there for a year and a half and suddenly they decided that the pay they had given me was too much so they wanted to take it back and I didn't quite understand that I was like oh this school is a is a well known university how can they just decide that they made payment errors from all of their teachers and they add they all the money back, and I didn't refuse. Um, but my I had many questions, and because I had questions about it, it was almost like they wanted to punish me because I had these questions. And because I had questions like, okay, how about the people that already left their jobs here? How about others that you can't contact? How are you going to get money back from them? So it was almost like, oh, the people who are still here working hard for us. We were you're we going to be punished, and so sometimes I think there is a 
there's a lack of, you know, there's a difference. And I'm not saying in the U.S. was a good situation too, because if you don't, um, you know, try to manage people very much as well and give them too much freedom, they also can take advantage of it. And there's also bad situations that have happened that too. And I think, oh, that about working hours and efficiency. I think counties really work till they, you know, they work till they drop. But I mean, that's a great yeah. Okay, it seems like my time, I've been told my time is, is up, so. Okay, thank you. If you have any questions, then you can, you can ask it in the Q&A time. Thanks.